Hello class and welcome to our lecture on negligence. Now negligence is something that uh, is clearly the the largest uh, area of law in which uh, plaintiffs seek to recover damages. See negligence is all around us. It's all that we see when we talk about people slipping and falling or car accidents. Those are all based upon negligence, okay? So uh, we're going to get into it. Now, you could spend days talking about negligence. It's such a, a unique and large area of law. But what we want to concentrate on are you know, the, the basic concepts so that we understand negligence and how we can use it in our business worlds moving forward to make us better managers and owners of restaurants or hotels or whatever it is that um, we're into that we're able to uh, negate negligence as much as possible. So let's get right to it. All right, the first thing about negligence is there are four elements to negligence, okay? The first element is duty, second element is breach, the third element is causation, and the fourth element is damages. And we're going to unpack each of those, but those are the four elements. Some people say there's five elements. They break causation into two different areas, actual cause and proximate cause. So if you see the, that word proximate causation, if you're kind of out there in the world or Googling or, or inside of our text, uh, causation can be broken into two types, um, actual and proximate. But for our purposes in this video, we're going with four. So duty is where it begins with. So in order to be negligent to someone, I have to owe them a duty of care, okay? I have to owe them a duty of care. So who do we owe a duty to? Um, well, a lot of people, uh, especially in business. So say we own a hotel, okay? Well, every person, every guest in that hotel, we owe a duty to, like we're a duty of protection to not harm them. And that goes for pretty much any business we're in. Or say we're driving our car. It has nothing to do with business. But we have a duty to all the people around us not to wreck into them. Okay? We have a duty. Now, the second part of that, though, is do we have a duty to everyone? And the answer is no. Okay? The answer is no. So we're going to start and we're going to begin with who are the people we do not owe a duty of care to. Okay? And... The main person we do not owe a duty of care to is a trespasser, okay? We do not owe a duty to a trespasser. So uh, there are two types of trespassers. There are known trespassers and there are unknown trespassers. Now, if it's a known trespasser, so how does that work? So say we own a piece of land and we notice that there's tents out there, beer bottles out there, or whatever it is, um, water bottles, it doesn't matter whether it's alcoholic or not. And we know people are out there, okay? And at the end of the day, there's a well on that piece of land, and that well in the fall gets covered by leaves, and you can't see the well. Well, we need to post signs, we need to do things, even though it's in the middle of our 100-acre woods. It doesn't matter because we know there are trespassers out there. So we need to make sure that they're aware of man-made dangers like a well. Um, now, if you don't know of trespassers, then you owe no duty at all. Um, so, you know, if they fall in the well, they fall in the well. You had no idea people were out there. It shouldn't have been out there anyways, but you didn't even know it. So no duty to known trespassers. But in general... For the most part, you do not owe a duty to, to trespassers. However, if there is a man-made defect in the land um, and you know that trespassers are there, you should attempt to warn them of that um, danger. Now, you know, say you invite someone into your business uh, or as a social guest, you owe them a duty of care. Um, now, let's talk about the differences between those. And you're going to want to know these two terms. The first term is a licensee. Okay, and uh, the second term is an invitee. Okay, now for our purposes, we owe a duty of care to all of these people, to licensees and invitees. But what is the difference? A licensee is a social guest, like in your home. So if you invite your friends over for dinner, those are licensees. Okay, 
an invitee is like an invited guest to a business, all right? So it's for businesses. Now, I mean, there's all kinds of state laws, but for the most part, the difference in negligence is you owe a higher duty to an invitee than a licensee, okay? So the, the big difference is a licensee is the social guest. It's people we like. It starts with an L, licensee. We got to warn them of any danger. So if we're like, oh, hey, by the way, um, if you go upstairs, the second step is broken. Skip it. Just go from one to three. You have to warn them of a known danger. Uh, but not an invitee has a higher level in which you got to fix it, a known danger. You, so you can't just tell people to walk into your business, oh, by the way, skip the second step. No, it needs to be fixed, okay? So that is kind of, um, you know, a, a basic synopsis of those two key terms. You'll want to know that. And what you really want to know is invitees are business guests, licensees are people you like, they're social guests. Um, so that's the first part of thing is duty. Who do we owe a duty to? Licensees, invitees, not really trespassers. Uh, now, the second element is breach, okay? So breach is falling below the standard of care, okay? So what is the standard of care? How do we know it? Well, there's um, two basic ones that we wanna talk about. I wanna say we're gonna talk about three basic ones, okay? In the standard of care and duty. The first one is just the most general one is that we owe the standard of care is we sh it's called the reasonably prudent person test. Reasonably prudent person test. That means that uh, we should do what a reasonably prudent person would do. So say we're in our car driving down the road. A reasonably prudent person would drive slower than the speed limit. They would not go above the speed limit. That would be the reasonably prudent thing to do. A reasonably prudent person would come to a complete stop at a stop sign. A reasonably prudent person would not change lanes without using their blinker. These, these are that's the kind of the test. What would a reasonably prudent person be? That's that's one. The second one is for uh, um, you know professionals. So like a doctor would be an example. Okay, well, the reasonably prudent person doesn't know how to do brain surgery, but this doctor is. Well, he's held to the level of a reasonably prudent surgeon. Okay, so he has a higher level, just not of a person, but of a reasonably prudent person with his knowledge and um, or her expertise. Okay, so that's kind of the the standard of care there. And the third one is what we call negligence per se. Okay, negligence per se. Now, I love to test on Latin words. So, negligence per se means that you are assumed to have breached your duty of care because you broke a law or an ordinance or a statute or a rule or something of that sense. So, for instance, um, if there is a law stating that you cannot drive faster than 55 miles an hour, well, that's considered to be a you know, negligence per se. We don't really have to prove that the reasonably prudent person drives above the speed limit because it's a law. So if you break the law, you're breaching your duty to the people around you. It's, it's a pretty simple concept, okay? Um, so that's the, the three that we're gonna kind of talk about or we have discussed inside of, you know, this portion of it. Now, the third element of negligence is causation so act so there's two types of causation actual causation and proximate causation what these mean is that your negligence actually caused the damages to the person so for instance say you are um you're at you work at a restaurant okay yes we work at a restaurant and you uh spill water one of your waitresses spills water onto the floor okay and instead of cleaning it up or putting out a sign or anything like that you just leave it there and you figure eh, i don't have time to mess with it right now i'm in the middle of cooking this omelet that is not what the reasonably prudent person would do the reasonably prudent person would put out a sign floor is wet they mop it they do all those things okay so 
but we're talking about actual cause. So if I walk over there and I slip and fall on your water, well, it's, and I hurt my back. Well, that is the actual cause of me hurting my back is slipping on your water, okay? Now, flip it. Say I was in a car accident the day before and I hurt my back, okay? So I've hurt my back. I have herniated discs, number you know three and four. And I walk into your restaurant saying, facts, there's water on the floor, you didn't clean it up, and I slip and fall in the water and I hurt my back. But I already, I had already injured my back. Yes, I have herniated disc three and four, but it had nothing to do with slipping on your water. I did slip on your water, but that's not why my back is hurt. It's not the actual cause of my back being hurt. The actual cause of my back being hurt is that car accident I was in yesterday. You see, so just because we're negligent doesn't mean you get damages or get you know any type of relief. It has to actually cause the uh, injury. And proximate cause, it has to be reasonably foreseeable that someone could get injured slipping on the water. So, to give you an example, is it is reasonably foreseeable that someone could slip on water on tile and fall and hurt themselves. Uh, I mean, that is, I mean, completely reasonable, okay? But, uh, I mean, it has to be foreseeable. So, for instance, I'll give you an example of something that, uh, I mean, we'll go pretty far out there. So, you have the water on the floor. The guy slips on the water, okay? As he slips on the water and he's falling backwards, his shoe flings off of his foot. And he's fine. But the shoe that flinged off of his foot hit one of the patrons hats off of their head and then that hat flew onto another table spooked a dog who bit someone walking by that is not a foreseeable outcome for leaving water on the floor that someone would slip and fall their shoe would fall off and knock off somebody's hat scare a dog who would bite someone so we don't think that normally a dog bite would come from leaving uh, water on the floor. So, I mean, that's a pretty extreme example, but that's kind of what we're getting at, is it needs to be a foreseeable thing. Um, it has to be, you know, in the realm of possibility. Uh, so, in reasonable possibility at that. So that's causation. And the final thing is damages. Somebody has to actually get hurt. So if I slip and fall in the water, but I'm not hurt, then you don't get anything. Okay, you have to actually be hurt. Okay? So it's kind of that whole... Uh, no harm, no foul kind of thing. Now, there are, um, so that is negligence. So what you need to know about negligence is there are four or five elements, depending which way it goes. But they are duty, breach, causation, damages. You gotta have those four things, okay? Um, next thing we wanna talk about is, I guess you could say the uh, defenses. Um, to uh, negligence. And the most common one, hands down, and the one that we're gonna kind of talk about inside of this, uh, well, there's gonna be two we're gonna talk about. The, the first one is assumption of the risk, okay? So, that is where someone lays, puts a sign out. It says, caution wet floor. And the people w still walk past the sign, and they slip and fall. Well, now you have a defense saying, I had a sign warning you, and you assume the risk of continuing walking on your path. That's assumption of the risk. Or like when you sign a waiver. Okay, we've all done that. So you're going parasailing, and you're signing a waiver saying, hey, parasailing is dangerous. Understand that, you know, people get hurt doing this all the time, and they get hurt doing all these different things. Or you're about to go on a roller coaster, and it says in big letters, if you have heart problems, don't go on this roller coaster. If you're pregnant, don't go on this whole roller coaster. If you have high blood pressure, don't go on this roller coaster. And then you have a stroke on the roller coaster because you have high blood pressure. Well, you assume the risk. There's a big sign. I mean, that's their defenses. Now, does it always work? No. Does it work a lot? Yes. So, uh, but that's the number one defense to negligence is the person assumed the risk. Now, the second one. And this is highly tested. You are gonna to wanna to know this. It will be on exams. It's the difference between contributory negligence 
and comparative negligence, okay? And it's a defense, contributory negligence and comparative negligence. So let's talk about the differences. What this means is contributory negligence means that if you contributed to your injuries just 1%, you can't get anything, okay? And that's for a jury to decide. But let's the let's use a let's use let's not use a business type of scenario. Let's let's just use a car because that's the simplest way to do it. And you're driving your car and now I'm not saying that this is how it goes. We're just we're just trying to 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 get a clear picture in our head. So you're driving your car, right? And you're texting and driving. Okay, and you're texting a little bit, you're looking up, you're texting, you're going down the road, you're texting, now you're playing with your radio, you're talking to the guy in the back seat. I mean, you are distracted during your driving. But you're driving the speed limit, you're in your lane, but you're definitely distracted. And you're going through an intersection, light is green, you're doing perfect, but you still are playing radio and texting and talking to your friends and you're distracted and someone runs the red light coming from the side street and they T-bone you, bang, right in the side of your car. Well, they're obviously at fault. They ran a red light, okay? They, they, they ran a red light. Uh, but you go to a jury and they say, hey, listen, we know that we ran the red light, but this guy was texting and driving. He was talking to his friends. He was playing with his radio. And the reason I T-boned was because I had a malfunction in my car. My throttle stuck. My brakes weren't working. I was not being negligent at all. It was just an accident. My brakes wouldn't work. I couldn't stop. And if this guy would have not been texting and playing with his radio and talking to his friends, he might have seen me as I was honking my horn and doing everything I could. And, you know, we would have been better. And then the other side argues, well, you ran a red light. I mean, at the end of the day, don't talk about what we were doing. We were, we were, you know, driving safely uh, down the road uh, at speed limit in our lane, going through a light that was green. And the jury comes back. He goes, you know what? They were driving safe. They were driving in their lane. He was playing with his radio. He's ten percent at fault. But the guy who T-boned him is ninety percent at fault. At the end of the day. You know, you got to make sure your brakes are functioning. It's not anyone's fault that your car brakes don't work, but you. So, contributory negligence. Um, excuse me. Um, yeah, contributory negligence. So, what does that mean? That means if you contributed at all to the negligence, you can't get any money. So, the jury says you're 10% at fault because you were playing with your radio. You can't get paid at all. So, you your car smashed. It's $5,000 damaged. You can't sue them for a penny. Okay, not one dime because you contributed to the negligence, even if it was just a little bit. Doesn't matter. Now that's only in a minority of states. The vast majority of the states have uh, what is called comparative negligence. Okay, so same exact fact pattern, except for we're in a comparative negligence state, and what comparative negligence says is that they're going to deduct your reward by your amount of fault. So you had five thousand dollars in damage. You're 10% at fault in this. They're going to take 10% of $5,000, which is 500 bucks, and deduct it from your award. So the guy who ran the red light owes you $4,500 for your $5,000 in damage because he's 90% at fault. So he has to pay 90% of $5,000. And they deduct that 10% from yours, which is $500. That is by far the most common um, in the United States. Uh, Florida, uh, where I'm at, is a comparative negligence state. There's only a few that are contributory negligence, just very, very few. So, um, that, but you want to know that. Contributory, if you contribute at all, no money. Comparative, you know, that is where they take your percentage of fault and deduct it from your reward. It'll be on exam. So make sure you know that. And then the final... Um, topic that we want to uh, talk about when it comes to negligence is what's called strict liability. Okay, strict liability. And this is a, a difficult concept for a lot of students to wrap their head around. Um, and you don't really quite get it. I'll tell you what, there's actually going to be two things we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about strict liability and recipsa locator. But strict liability. 
strict liability means that no matter what happens, you're at fault because what you're doing is so outrageously dangerous. So the most common ones are people who carry nuclear waste like in their, uh, like their semi-trucks and a drunk driver hits them and nuclear waste goes all over the road. They still hold the nuclear truck driver at fault uh, because what he's doing is so abnormally dangerous that you're, you're going to be liable. So you just know when you're in that business, you better charge a lot of money because if anything happens, you're going to be at fault. But the most commonly tested one is abnormally dangerous animals. Abnormally dangerous animals get people all the time. Here is the, the, the case on point. So, guy owns a tiger, okay? And he has a license to own the tiger, okay? So, he has a tiger. I mean, he's a centric billionaire with a tiger. And tiger's in the cage. It's in a nice cage. I mean, gorgeous cage. Tiger has a vet that comes to see him all the time. There are professional trainers that come in um, and care for the tiger. The tiger has a nutritionist, okay? This tiger is living better than any of us, I promise you. Well, this guy has a party. And at this party, uh, one of the guests goes out to see the tiger. And the guy told everybody, everyone needs to stay in the house, no one go out into the backyard. Okay, that's where we keep our animals, and they're all in their cages and penned up, and I don't want to spook them. I don't want anybody messing with them. I mean, please leave that area alone. Stay in the house. Well, one guy was like, ooh, he said, don't go, so I'm going. And the guy goes out there, and he uh, sees this tiger. And he thinks, hmm, tiger. So he looks up at the tiger, gives it to the cage. And Tiger just looking at him. Tiger comes up to him. Tiger thinks he's about to get fed or something. I mean, Tiger lives a great life. Tiger's not in fear at all, you know. Uh, when someone comes up to Tiger, normally it's a good thing. So this guy, he had had a little bit to drink. Not a lot. He was not crazy intoxicated, but he had, you know, several drinks over the course of the night. And the guy decides he's going to pet the Tiger. Well, he pets the Tiger, Okay. And the tiger kind of purrs, you know. It, it, tiger wasn't giving like a mean vibe, but he was giving a purring vibe. Well, the guy who was a little bit intoxicated decided that he'd get a little braver and try and like rub the tiger's belly because the tiger's purring, okay? Well, he sticks his hand up under the cage and he has his whole hand in the, in the tiger's cage and he's trying to pet the tiger's belly, and the tiger doesn't like it very much. And the tiger kind of shows his teeth. And the guy removes his hand from the cage, and the tiger's now showing his teeth. And he has his nose right up to the cage. And the guy takes his hand and decides he's going to flick the tiger in, a no in the nose. He goes to flick the tiger in the nose, and the tiger takes his hand right off. Now, who's at fault? <laughs> Believe it or not, the billionaire that owned the tiger. Even though he told them not to go out there. Even though he had the tiger in the cage. All those things. Even though this guy was actually trying to harm the tiger by flicking it in the nose. Even after the tiger warned him by like showing him his teeth. All those factors... It didn't matter because the guy owned a tiger, regardless of what happens, he's at fault, even to a trespasser. Because that guy was trespassing, he was told not to go there. So where we're at inside of strict liability is this is what you're looking for. If you see a question that it'll be a tiger, a lion, a bear, a cougar, it'll be something you know abnormally dangerous. A uh, guy has a pet alligator in his pool, okay? It'll be something like that. It'll be extreme. It won't be guy has a dog with a propensity to bite. It won't be anything like that. It'll be a ridiculous, um, dangerous animal. You know, guy has a king cobra as a pet. It won't be a python. It'll be a king cobra. Even though python's pretty dangerous, that's not abnormally dangerous. So people have pet pythons all the time. 
It'll be something outlandish, a black mamba, something like that. All right, so that's strict liability. And then the last thing that we want to talk about, because this does get tested sometimes, um, it's res ipsa locator. Res, R-E-S, ipsa. I-S, no, it's I-P-S-A, res ipsa, okay? What is that? That is where there's negligence and we just can't prove it. Like we can't prove the breach. We can't prove how he fell below the standard of care. But I mean, the jury needs to hear the story. So the case on point is a guy is walking, and this is this happens a hundred years ago, but a guy's walking down the street and a barrel falls out of a second story window, okay? Rolls out of a second story window and hits him in the head. Okay? No one sees the barrel fall out of the window. No one sees someone push the barrel out the window. People run up to the second story. There are barrels everywhere, no people, okay? So we can't prove the breach. We can't prove that they were throwing the barrels recklessly or that somebody was trying to walk on the barrels or something stupid. We can't prove how the barrel fell out the window, but barrels just don't fall out of windows. And the window wasn't open, like it crashed through a window. So something or someone somehow took that barrel, did something they shouldn't have been doing because barrels don't go throwing out of windows. So that was the, the original case on a point that talks about recipsa. And that mean, that is Latin for the thing speaks for itself. I'd write that down. That's highly tested. Recipsa means the thing speaks for itself. And, uh, and that's kind of what it's saying is that barrels just don't fall out of windows without negligence. And it, and it doesn't mean that you're wrong. It just means the jury gets a chance to decide if it is, you know, uh, probable, more likely than not, that someone um, did a negligent act. And, uh, and that's why the barrel fell out of the building. So that is our... Uh, our basics of um, negligence. I will talk about one final thing I'll leave you with, and that is duty to rescue. Um, you do not have a duty to rescue. So it is not negligence to not rescue somebody unless you caused the, uh, the peril or the danger. So the example is, say you're Michael Phelps. He's like the greatest swimmer of all time. He's won 18 gold medals and he's walking past the college uh, retention pond. And one of the frat kids has decided that to you know, prove to his frat brothers that he's worthy, he is going to swim the length of the retention pond. Upon swimming the length of the retention pond, he gets a cramp in his leg and he's beginning to drown. And Michael Phelps is walking by and Michael Phelps, doesn't jump in and save him. He just keeps on walking. Sorry, dude. You pledged for the fraternity. It's not my fault that you're drowning. Michael Phelps is fine. He hasn't done anything wrong. He has no duty to rescue that guy. He didn't have any part in putting him in peril. Now, all the frat boys that are on the shoreline for rush week that were cheering him on to jump on in and swim across, they have a duty to rescue because they were part of the reason why the danger incurred. So what we all we really need to know, you know for the, the sake of our exam is that you have no duty to rescue anyone. You don't have to rescue anyone uh, unless you caused the danger. So for instance, say uh, uh, you are, you know, it, and that's how it'll be. I guess the way I want to leave it is a lot of times what professors will do is they will make it somebody like Michael Phelps. It'll be someone that it, that should do it, okay? But you don't have to unless you cause the peril, and I'll give you the last one, it's your job. So say you're a lifeguard. You have to jump in and save people. If you're a police officer, it's your duty to serve and protect. If you're a fireman and there's a fire in a house and you didn't cause the fire, but it's your job, it's your employment to rescue, then yes. 
So that's where it is. You don't have a duty unless you cause the peril or it's your employment position to do that. Uh, so that leaves us uh, with our ending for this particular lecture. Thank you for tuning in and we will see you next time.